Welcome to First Time for Everything, a podcast for curious people. I'm your host, Danny Elliott. I've toured the world as a backing vocalist for some of the biggest names in music, owned a prop rental business, ran a vintage boutique out of a camp where I renovated, and have had a lot of firsts in my life. I created this podcast in hopes of inspiring you to take a chance on something you've been wanting to try for the first time. We're going to discover a lot of cool stuff together, and I'm so happy you're here. Hi, first timers. I am so, so honored to have Linda K. Klein on the podcast today. Linda is the author of Pure, Inside the Evangelical Movement That Shamed a Generation of Young Women and How I Broke Free. In addition to being an author, Linda is the founder and president of Break Free Together, a nonprofit storytelling organization dedicated to helping people release shame and claim their whole selves. This episode hits really close to home for me as a kid who was raised born again Christian during the height of the purity culture movement in the early 2000s and who has been unraveling the damage, making revelations and healing ever since. Linda brings so much insight, thoughtfulness and intelligence to such a heavy topic for so many of us and I think anyone who is currently trying to make sense of being exposed to purity culture at any point in their life will find her words cathartic and truly validating. This is First Time Kissing Purity Culture Goodbye. So today we are here with Linda K. Klein, the author of uh, one of, I think, the most important books I've read in a long time, Pure. Uh, Thank you so, so much for being here today. I'm so, when I told some of my friends, we did a little book club around your book a couple years ago. And when I sent out the text that uh, I was like, this is not a drill. (laughs) Linda K. Klein is going to be on the podcast. They were like, oh my God. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Yes. So very excited to have you here. Um, I know we're going to be talking about purity culture today, which is a very layered topic. um, And there's so many different directions we can end up going with it. But um, I think uh, just to start people off or anyone who maybe has never heard of purity culture before, can you talk on like, what is your definition of purity culture or kind of the definition you've aggregated over the years? Oh, that's such a good question because it's a really complex question. Um, I've come to see purity culture as something much larger than what a lot of other folks are referring to when they use the term purity culture. Hmm. Um, I think of a purity culture as any culture that is fundamentally defining people and in particular women and girls as either pure or impure based on their sexual and gender performance. Hmm. So you can see that, you know, based on that definition, we have many, many purity cultures around the world in a lot of religious traditions in a lot of um, cultural traditions that have nothing to do with religion in a lot of families and so on and so forth. When people use the term purity culture, however, what they're often talking about is what I call the purity movement, which is a movement that was built on top of what I would argue was already a culture of sexual shaming toward women and girls in our country and around the world. So it started in the early 1990s and it was born out of the white American evangelical Christian church. And this purity movement took the concepts of purity culture and first of all, ramped them up to the next level for the 30% of adolescents who are growing up in evangelical Christian youth groups here in this country um, and abroad, right? Um, But also had this really intentional effort to spread these messages um, in a more diluted form into every single place they possibly could. Very evangelical to do, right? You know, all about all about witnessing, Mm -hmm. you know, finding our solution and making sure that everyone everyone aligns with it, whether or not it's uh, tested or <laughs> data yeah, driven. Yeah, or whether or not they want to align with it or not, we, we're going to bring it to you, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we start to see in the purity movement, we start to see um, the beginning of sex education in public schools in response to the AIDS crisis, which has dramatically shaped 
by um, purity teachings, particularly out of the white American evangelical Christian church, and is funded by these $2 billion of federal money, much of which required state matches, so even more money coming in from the state level for abstinence only before marriage messaging. Um, and we start to see it get into federal aid for uh, HIV AIDS. We start to see it get into, you know, all kinds of other things. Um, but what people often think of when they think of purity culture and of the purity movement is the products, right? Or are the products. We think of the purity rings. We think of the purity pledges. We think of the purity balls. We think of the, you know, there were two purity themed Bibles, right? That literally added pages to the Bible about the importance of women and girls remaining pure. I forgot about that. I forgot yeah. about the purity Bibles. Yeah. 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 With very modern, you know, kind of language and modern advice. And um, yeah, it's, and I think I really, I feel like talking about the Bibles is actually a really useful way to bring home how much purity became the way for adolescents to prove their faith in evangelical churches and just how intense these teachings became in that arena even as the teachings spread around the world you know we started to see even disney stars and you know folks on stage at the mtv music awards touting their purity rings and talking mm -hmm. about why they want to remain pure and, and i'm so glad you talked about how far reaching uh purity culture is because i think when you're in it when you're growing up in it it feels so right here and it's not until you kind of get out of it that you start to get at, at least for me this perspective uh more of a bird's eye view of like wow oh it's in that and it's in that and it's there and there and um you know i, I even saw something on instagram yesterday um, this mom had compiled a reel of all of these like t-shirts like for girls and um, like book artwork for girls and all of the eyelids are closed or looking down mm -hmm. and it's like this demure uh, thing that's kind of just kind of forced on you and, and if you're not naturally somebody who is like demure maybe you're, you're kind of loud and you have like things to say purity culture it feels like you are like actively sinning when uh you can't find your way into that kind of uh like personality subset yeah um, well i mean kind of what you're getting at here is that you know purity culture i think people think of it of it as being about sex but i actually think at its core it's about gender yes um because we're really talking about um, first of all, a very clear gender binary, right? No spectrums yes. <laughs> in this world. Yes. Um, and within that binary, very stereotypical expectations. Mm -hmm. And for women and girls, that means these kind of eyelids down, um, you know, submitting to the authorities in your life, which as a woman or girl means all men, right? Mm -hmm. Boys. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's a very particular persona that women are expected to adhere to and sexual purity, again, I'm putting this in quotes for folks who are not listening or not watching this on camera, um, you know, is, is one of those gender expectations, which is why it's taught so differently to those of us who were raised as girls in the culture versus those of us who are raised in, as boys. Yeah. And I really, I, I love what you're talking about, about that kind of eyelids down. It's interesting. So uh, this is maybe a little like a thing that you might find interesting. So the cover of my book, the original kind of mock-up that they gave me for the cover was this, you know, young girl, maybe 14 years old, eyes down, right, in a prayerful position with like a doily around her neck and a cross, right, you know, like very, very classic. And I remember saying to them, um, in response, let me first of all tell you a little bit about evangelicalism. We're not talking about a, a small group of people that lives off in the woods, <laughs> you know, yeah. and is and is somehow, you know, looks like they're living, you know, in another era, right? It's mainstream, it's modern, it's marketed to be cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. But 
at the same time, this kind of these old these old ideas about what women and girls were supposed to be were in some ways kind of embodied by that image, right? Mm -hmm. So even if somebody is, you know, holding a microphone and singing on stage and, you know, in a in like in front of the whole church and their worship band or whatever it is, they also somehow have to, even as they're being that modern self, mm -hmm. portray pray that doilied 14 year old girl, right? So yeah. it all becomes these really, you know, you know, you're constantly trying to figure out how to be, who to be, how you'll be accepted in this community. Everybody within the culture has different uh, rules for what will make you pure and what will make you impure. And everything, you know, about women and girls is traditionally sexualized within culture, but especially within, you know, a, a purity culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and all the more in a purity movement. So we start to see things like charisma, or, you know, um, having a voice, right, as sexualized as flirtation, or as trying to be like the guys, you know, and that horrific F word, right? Feminist, right? <laughs> oh God, or Jezebel was what I always got. Right. You have right. a Jezebel spirit. And I was like, bring her on. <laughs> like, let's do wow. It. Yeah. Jezebel. Yeah. 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 Religious language for she who leads men mm -hmm. down the the highway to hell. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's so interesting. I mean, there's so many, you're just bringing up so many different great points. I'm like, oh my God, I don't even know where to like go, but I know, um, yeah, even uh, like I grew up singing in church and my dad was a worship leader. And I, I think um, one of the things and an elder in our church as well. And um, one of the things you men just mentioned was a kind of like the inconsistency with the messaging, which I think for me was the initial kind of spark that made me start to question like, hey, something about this doesn't sit right with my spirit, like, like deeply in my spirit. And yeah. because I think my parents somehow, thank God, were always really supportive of me being independent. They were always like, you never have to get married. You never have to have kids. They always knew music was the thing that I wanted to mm -hmm. pursue. And they're like, whatever you need to do to do that, like, we are going to like support you in that. Yet at the same time, it was the I did get a purity ring. I was in like a youth group culture that like heavily shamed any kind of sexual activity before marriage. I remember, you know, one of our youth group leaders who I loved and um, I still have so much respect for her, ended up getting pregnant at around 19 with her serious boyfriend, like, uh, but they weren't married. And I remember it was like a massive scandal in the church and just the way that she was treated. I remember listening to my parents talk about it in the car on the way home from youth group. And I remember just saying to them, well, like, aren't we supposed to love her and support her like isn't that what you know like we talk about supporting like single mothers and but yet when there's someone right in front of our face who we have this like established relationship with somehow it's like it's immediate disappointment and not immediate care you know and I think you had you had mentioned there's a passage in your book that's a pretty heartbreaking account by one of the interviewees who talks about being raped by her brother and she made some really incredible points about how like purity culture excuses male sexuality and amplifies female sexuality and it shames consensual sexual activity and silences non-consensual sexual activity mm -hmm. um, i'm sort of combining a couple things over a couple yeah, pages yeah. and um and the church views men as animals with no agency and the whole as a girl it's your job to stop guys from doing stuff kind of thinking and you know women are taught their bodies are evil and men are taught their minds are and it's like all of this blame falls on women or uh, i don't even want to say like people who identify as women because there's not even room for that in the church mm -hmm. you know like mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't have especially back in the 90s early aughts like wouldn't have even been welcomed you know yeah, absolutely not today either <laughs> yeah and i think in very rare situations would it be welcome today i think you you talk about a church towards the end of the book that seems like it's very open to uh people who identify across the spectrum um i attended a church church briefly in new york that also 
was like that. But yeah, I think for the most part, for sure. And like, I think that those, you know, I did a lot of research to find those handful of churches, right? Mm -hmm. That were yeah. evangelical churches that were affirming. And, um, you know, even they are really struggling to hold on to that part of their identity, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the reasons I, I like to differentiate between purity culture and the purity movement is because I would argue that purity culture is very much alive and well. Right. Mm. Um, the purity movement started to die down when we saw a curb in federal funding for abstinence only before marriage education because it simply didn't work. Right. Mm. Um, but, you know, so that's when we stopped seeing the rings and the pledges and yeah. things like that. But the ethos, the teachings, the culture is definitely um, still very much alive and well. One of my biggest takeaways that I just noticed coming up in, in your book with different people that you spoke with and also my own experience, I think a main theme is this disembodiment mm. that the, the church proliferates in, through, via purity culture, via the purity movement, in that you are taught that like you have no agency, especially as a woman or a girl, or like you... It, not many things are up to you or you need to go outside of yourself to seek validation, seek holiness. Um, I don't know, is that something that you experienced yourself and kind of when you started to kind of realize the impact purity culture had had on you or, or like mm -hmm. what is your what has your relationship been to to purity culture and kind of breaking it down? Yeah, well, let me break it down according to what you just shared um, first, and then I um, will talk a little bit about myself. But I think you're really spot on. You know, I think the crux of when I think about purity culture recovery, um, which I work on a lot these days, um, the crux is really how do we take a perception of ourselves, of our bodies, of our lives, of the world that is rooted in what others want for and from us, mm. right? And flip that you know, to really create a life uh, of our own making that aligns with our feelings, our thoughts, our beliefs, our values, our choices, things that we have been systematically taught to uh, tamp down to such a degree that when a lot of folks start to leave purity culture, they actually struggle with accessing, right? They've been tamped down so successfully that, you know, what are my real feelings about this? Mm -hmm. I might feel comfortable experiencing some feelings that I was told are okay in some settings, but not other feelings, right? Yeah. Um, men and boys, you know, certainly are, are um, taught that sadness is weakness, whereas mm -hmm. women are taught that anger is, you know, ugly, right? You know, um, a lot of folks are taught that uh, contentment, peace, happiness, pleasure, in particular bodily pleasure, right, yes. um, is bad, right, which can make us even distrust, you know, moments of, of life going well, right? Yeah, yes. So, so how do we access these parts of ourselves that we've been taught to, um, to ultimately destroy, right, and mm -hmm. in lieu of trusting other people's thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and thoughts on what we should be yes. doing and feeling in our own lives. Yeah. Um, how do we surface them? How do we then learn to trust them when we've been taught not to trust them? And then how do we learn to make choices based on them? And finally, how do we advocate for those choices, even yeah. when others, you know, say, hey, that's not the right path for you? Um, you know, for example, you know, one of the things that I remember really struggling with growing up was um, was this kind of modesty piece. We were talking a little bit about the modesty piece earlier, um, or you were. You know, I remember I remember constantly being pulled aside and told that I was a stumbling block because I was wearing something that was sinful, but I never knew what I would get in trouble for because it all just felt so nonsensical to me, right? And also like it, as someone who developed very early, my breasts were constantly a point of conversation, mm. like something I have no control over. And to th this day, it's taken me years to get to a point where I am not weaponizing them against myself, mm. you know? Um, uh, and I, I remember even in high school, I had a friend who had a three finger rule, like no shirts could be yeah. 
in three fingers because she didn't want to be a stumbling block. And it's like, just thinking about all of that is so, it just makes my blood boil. And like, it feels like we were robbed of this opportunity to really develop this like healthy sense of autonomy. And, um, and healthy sense of sexuality, you know? Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, to... so you're con- no, you're right. Yeah. It's, you know, we learn to police ourselves. We learn to look in the mirror and be like, what about me is going to be something that I um, am pulled aside and accused of being a Jezebel for, or yeah. accused of being a stumbling block for, right. You know, is it, is my, does my shirt go down four fingers? Does it, is it too, is it too low in the back? Is it, you know, too close on the, edge and my bra strap might show is it you know whatever it is but you're essentially every time you look in the mirror and i i mean a mirror both literally and figuratively right when you look at yourself Mm -hmm. we are taught to question every part of us through the lens of how are other going to other people who we have given and been told we must give the right to determine our worth Mm -hmm. right how are other people going to perceive X, Y, Z? And how do I make sure that they believe I am worthy so that I am worthy? Mm. Right? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, to your point around recovery and how I recovered or to your question around how I, you know, started to contend with these things. I remember, you know, it was little things, right? When I went to college, for example, I remember seeing that, all these people were pursuing things that I thought I was never allowed to pursue, not Mm -hmm. even because of purity culture, just because I wouldn't be good enough at it. Right. And we have to be perfect at everything. And we have to be, we have to be, you know, untouchable in order to maintain acceptance. So I remember one time I went to a friend's um, dorm room and she had all of these like drawings of boxes around the room. You know, I'm talking about like the perspective where you have the lines. Yeah. Yeah. 3d boxes so they were covering all of her walls of her room and i remember being like you know what's going on with all these boxes and she's like you know i i'm taking an art class and my teacher said i'm really struggling with perspective and i should just draw a lot of boxes and i remember being like i can draw a box like (laughs) why do i think i'm not allowed to pursue art right mm-hmm. you like like what like why like if i could draw a box yeah surely i could take an art class right and um and i remember going in and taking an art class and it felt very connected to my sexuality it felt very connected to my sensuality it felt very connected to my artistic creative messy you know um self that i was just starting to learn I could give myself permission to express, right? Mm. So it wasn't just, you know, wanting to, you know, dress in a way that felt like myself. It was wanting to be myself. It was wanting to like sit in art studio alone at night. And, you know, speaking of looking in that mirror, I had this memory of staying in the art studio one night, um, you know, for hours into the middle of the night. And the assignment was to draw ourselves, right? And so, Um, I had a mirror there and I was drawing my face and I remember looking really deeply at my face as I did it and being like, God, have I ever seen myself before, right? Mm. This is the first time I remember really looking at myself and being like, huh, huh, that's who I am, right? And like, what is that behind my eyes and how do I capture that on the page? And what is that behind my eyes, right? Mm -hmm. And, And so, you know, I often break down this process that I was just starting in these stories, right? Um, You know, uh, this of reclaiming ourselves or reconstruction, as one might say, um, into three questions. The first is, uh, who are you? The second is, where are you going, right? What is your purpose? What do you want to do? What are your choices, right? And then the third is, who will go with you? Mm. not who will make the same choices, but who will stand by you as you are who you are and go where you've got to go. Yeah. And in purity culture, we are taught the exact same three questions in the opposite order. Mm. We are taught who are your people, the right ones, the good ones, the only ones that count, the only ones that go to heaven, the ones that get to determine your worth. What do they want you to do? And who do you need to be? What do you need to think, feel, believe, et cetera, to do those things, to maintain those people's valuing of you? Mm. So, so recovery is 
you know, this total rethinking of our lives. And, you know, it comes with these little wins, right, that we have to learn to celebrate, you know, even though they seem small, right, like taking an art class, <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be earth shattering to, yeah. to celebrate the fact that we are owning ourselves. Yeah, totally. That point about little wins is so true. I think that that has been my experience too. And I remember um, adjacent experience in college. I was in a, I, I was a jazz vocal major and uh, I was in what's called a combo. They're like small band groups and you uh, work out different arrangements that you all bring in. And I remember we were doing something and my combo teacher said to me, he's like, can you make it sound ugly? Mm. And I was like, I have no idea what you mean. And he was like, not everything has to be so clean. Mm. Not everything has to be so pretty all the time. And I want you to find that like color and texture and like you in the song and i was completely stumped i i i, I couldn't connect to that concept for years and then it finally like clicked for me at, at a certain point and i think that even so much of this um cleanliness uh had like even seeped into my creativity and it was like years of deconstructing that and like finding, letting myself fail in a way and like not sing so perfectly and and start to write songs that maybe said some things that I would have been scared to say like years prior or was like worried about my parents hearing in a lyric. And, but the more I flex that muscle, the more I started just like, peeling back these these layers you know and it does feel like this like slow accumulative thing and then you start to be able to more clearly kind of answer like who are you mm -hmm. uh, who are the people who are going to come with you Women's health is extremely important to me, and I think modern fertility is one of the most exciting, accessible new advancements to come out in recent years to help us really understand our bodies more. Whether you're ready to pop out a mini me like yesterday or the thought of being someone's parent after the night you had last night seems light years away, knowledge is power. Understanding how our bodies work to better be able to prepare for the future and take better care of ourselves right now is game changing. Modern Fertility doesn't just offer fertility testing. It also offers birth control, prenatal vitamins, ovulation and pregnancy tests, and just launched a sperm kit because fertility isn't just a woman's job, okay? So click the link in the show notes for $10 off your Modern Fertility hormone test and join the thousands of women who refuse to let fertility be a mystery. Now, back to the show. But I think it's it's difficult too in that, you know, I, I was wondering when you were interviewing the people in your book who have who are, seem to be in various stages of i don't know if if deconstruction is necessarily the right word i know it's like a hot button word that's being used a lot but um just for the sake of ease right now but who are in various stages of deconstruction did you notice any kind of through line in their personalities like does it feel like a nature versus nurture thing and the types of people who've decided to step back and kind of question their their faith or this aspect of their faith that's a good question i would say that there are kind of two two things one um people who never felt like they fit Mm. And that's a lot of people, right? Because we talked a little bit about the expectations. They're so, they're so um, limited in mm. the number of people who would naturally fit into them, right? Yeah. We're talking about a tiny percentage of people yes. who are naturally demure, naturally disconnected to their sexuality, no sexual thoughts, no sexual feelings, naturally, you know, um, uh, happy to let others lead them naturally, you know, et cetera. Right. Yeah. Um, naturally pretty nationally, naturally yeah. thin. all yeah. these things that are actually expectations of purity culture as well. Um, you know, coming back to your music piece, right. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who didn't feel like they belong. And I think that the folks who didn't feel like they belonged, 
um, whether it was because of simple, you know, having charisma or whether it was because they were queer or whether it's because they, you know, were a survivor and they were, you know, systematically erased from all of the purity culture talks and felt themselves on the outside um, and shamed in that regard, you know, whether we're talking about um, people who weren't white, whether we're talking about people who weren't, um, whose families weren't, you know, born in the United States, whether there are so many ways in which people have felt um, that they didn't belong, right? And I think that that feeling of not belonging, um, you know, eats at you over time. You know, for a lot of us, certainly for myself, I tried to belong for many years mm -hmm. and leaving was accepting that I was never going to, unless I, you know, became somebody else. And mm -hmm. I kind of liked who I was, frankly, yeah. you know, yeah. um, it took me a long time to really love who I was, mm -hmm. but I liked her enough <laughs> to yeah. be her. <laughs> right? Fight for her. Yeah. She could be. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's one category. And I think the other category is people for whom their lives weren't working. Right. Mm -hmm. So there were people who did everything right, who were able to belong, who and quote, I let me I'm put, putting right in quotes too. Right. Yeah. You know, who were able to belong, um, you know, and receive the rewards of being the good girl. Right. Um, and then you know, entered into adult life and everything fell apart. Maybe they got married and they found themselves, you know, doing, looking on the surface, like they were still that good girl in their heterosexual, you know, marriage bed, but they were actually unable to access their sexuality um, in marriage, just as they had been unable pre-marriage or as they had shut it down pre-marriage, right? Yeah. There's this teaching in purity culture that you're supposed to um, eradicate your sexuality until marriage, at which point you're supposed to flip your sexuality on like a light switch yeah. and become your husband's great sexual satisfier, his every fantasy. Y you become his yes, right? You're Without you're his uh, yes any every... training on, on how to uh, d do that <laughs> or, yeah. or, or be that or tat, I should say not training, but like um, support in connecting with that. Exactly. Side. Yeah. Quite the opposite, right? Yeah. Quite the opposite. Um, or maybe, you know, there's a, there's somebody in my book who I'm thinking of in particular, you know, who, who when she got very, very ill, um, that wasn't the perfect life she was promised, right? We were told if we're perfectly pure, that we will have an amazing life afterward. Mm -hmm. We'll have that perfect partner. We'll never have anything bad happen to us. And if anything small, you know, does come up that is challenging, we'll have the full support of the us, of the yeah. our people, right? Mm -hmm. And in reality, that is not always the case. So, so anyway, so I find that, you know, those are kind of two big categories right you know those who never felt they could quite do it all right and those who did it all right and it didn't turn into the fairy tale they were told it wouldn't would and then they were like what happened i yeah. dedicated my entire life to being able to have the heaven that i was promised here on earth and you know where is it right yeah. where is that perfect husband that i was supposed to wait on god to give me why am i you know still waiting and have never had a kiss at the age of 45 mm. why am i you know like there are so many stories like that um so yeah i would say i would say over time that's kind of how i thought about it i gave a tedx talk um a long time ago uh, about purity culture i've been doing this research for 16 years now mm -hmm. um you know and at that point i remember kind of breaking it down to people who were comfortable with the answer system of purity culture did better than people who were natural questioners mm -hmm. and i think that that's true to a certain extent um but i don't think it can really be broken down that much because like i said you know, some people, um, you know, were comfortable within the answer system, um, but the when the equation of shut down your sexuality, you know, didn't didn't lead to the like it's supposed to be like X equals Z, right? Like, you know, and and it didn't, right? X equal like. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, that's and that's so true. I, I I've always wondered that because I know I've always identified as like an innately very curious person. Hence the the premise of this podcast is to learn new things and introduce new things to people who maybe are trying to step outside of their comfort zone but haven't found the um, inspiration to to do that yet. And this has been such a transformative topic in my life um, because when you start to question purity, it's not just purity or questioning. I think you start to question everything. And mm. there is this another passage in your book, kind of going back to that embodiment point in a way on uh, page 211, one of the interviewees was saying, um, because to choose to have sex is almost impossible. The way that for me, the way that my mind was set up, the way that the world was set up for me, I couldn't do it. I would either have to decide to do something consciously and deliberately decide to do something that I was absolutely certain was completely wrong, which is a really hard thing to do, or I would have to somehow change what I believed before doing the thing, which is also really hard. Yep. And, and that sends you into this total spiral. And I remember when I left home and moved to New York to go to school, it was a solid two years of like deep emotional spiritual turmoil um, because I had met someone that I was very happy in a serious relationship with. I had lost my virginity and I remember I was attending Brooklyn Tabernacle at the time. So like every Sunday I'm getting this messaging about purity culture, yet throughout the week I'm in this very happy, committed, safe relationship. Um, and I remember just this pull between like my past life and what felt true for me in everyday life. And I remember like when I did lose my virginity, I remember I, I went home and talked to my roommate who was also raised in purity culture. And I was like, I would have waited for that. <laughs> like what? <laughs> if it, and that was my personal experience. I know, I know it's different for everybody, but I know um, it, it really, that was such a big, like light bulb moment for me because I was like, oh, wow, this is not at all the way that it had been described. And it actually felt so natural. And, you know, I, I think men are made out to, to seem very um, predatory. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're as a woman made to seem very like doe like and like I'm so vulnerable, you know, and, and it felt very respectful. And again, it was just a catalyst for me to start to question so many different things about my faith, the way I was raised. And yeah, I think for you, when when, you know, you started kind of like taking this apart, like how did it affect your faith at all? Or, or have you been able to kind of compartmentalize faith relationship to God in a different category from uh, the actions of the church and like the effect of purity culture? Yeah. Well, I would say it's been an evolution to be sure. Um, there were many years where I wanted nothing to do with religion. Mm -hmm. uh, and in those years, interestingly, though, I always I always maintained a belief in something larger than myself. We'll call it God, right? Um, you know, and felt a connection to that. In the mm -hmm. first six months or so after I left, though, I remember being like still living by purity cultures, rule, by evangelical rules, right? Mm -hmm. Though I had left. And so I remember telling myself, you know, I'm not allowed to pray right? Yes, I still feel this presence. Yes, I still have a drive to connect with it, but I'm not allowed to, right? Now I'm the bad girl. Now I've left. Now I'm the impure, unworthy, headed for hell girl, and I'm not allowed access to the divine, right? right. So I remember, I remember even, you know, praying once, hey, God, I would love to talk with you, but I'm not allowed to because I'm not, you know, I'm not who I'm supposed to be. So, you know, I like even just kind of like railing, railing against the community to God or maybe railing against God's God's what I perceive still as God's community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but over the years, I think I let myself first come back into relationship with a spiritual realm and, and find comfort in that outside of religion, outside of the church. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started to uh study the church right then i went from 
really kind of separating myself from religion to studying religion. Mm. I started to do interviews with people who were raised in purity culture. Uh, I started to to study what was happening in the religious landscape that led to purity culture, what was happening during purity culture. So, you know, I think at that point I identified as, you know, what today might be called an ex-evangelical. My identity was still tied to my evangelicalism, but as outside of it and as a researcher and a study, you know, one studying it. Um, but it was still a huge part of who I was, though it was not, though it was, it was a resistance to, mm -hmm. to something. Um, and then, you know, through that process, I started to meet people who were part of a very different formation of Christianity. I started to meet people who were, who had dedicated their lives to Christianity, uh, seminary presidents, you know, and pastors, but who believed of, you know, a very radical form of what Jesus's message was, who believed that, that Jesus, you know, came with a message of justice and that it was, you know, Christian to fight for equality of all kinds, right? Um, and that that was actually, you know, what the work of Christianity was, you know, not our personal purity, but mm -hmm. our justice work, you know, on behalf of the world to create, um, to create the kind of world that, that is rooted in love and, and acceptance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that was, you know, finding that world was, was cool. And for many years, I worked to support them professionally, um, but I still didn't feel comfortable going into religion myself. Mm. Um, eventually I joined, you know, as you, you and I actually share this kind of singer songwriter, you know, quality. Um, but I stopped, I stopped writing music a long time ago, unfortunately. Um, but I joined a gospel choir when I was living in New York city, mm -hmm. um, which I lived in for most of my adult life. Um, and in that gospel choir, which we won best gospel choir, uh, in our, I think it was the cross the Northeast two years in a row. So very <laughs> good gospel choir. Um, I loved that choir. It was so much fun. But in that gospel choir, I was so excited about singing gospel. You know, our, it was such a fun group of people. Our director went to Juilliard, like, you know, there was all this like flair and, yeah. you know, fun and I wanted to do it, but it was in a church. Yeah. So I remember being like, oh, oh, ah. And the first time I went to a rehearsal, I was just convinced that everyone in the room was watching me, um, you know, the women and thinking I was doing something wrong. I was sitting wrong. I must think of myself X. I was what? Oh, why didn't I think about what I wore before I showed up today? It's been so long since I've been in a religious culture. I forgot I should actually prepare myself for shaming. Right. You know, I was so right, worried. Yeah. Right. Prepare yourself for shaming. Yeah. 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 Not shield of armor. Exactly. Exactly. And the cardigan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, um, but anyway, so then, then what was really, what was really great that ended up happening though, is that I learned that this was a very different, you know, population of people. A lot of the folks were queer, you know, and a lot of the folks were living their own best lives, you know, whatever that looked like. Um, and so I really found that I was actually quite safe there in many ways, but then I had to contend with the fact that I was singing religious words. In, mm. these, in these songs. And I didn't agree with uh, them anymore, a lot of them. But over time, I gave myself permission to mean what I meant by them. Yeah. And not what I would have been expected to mean in order to have been integritous growing up. Right. Mm. So essentially reclaiming the parts of Christianity that I still loved. Right. Which included, you know, there's some awesome gospel music out there. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, being able to reclaim it and to love what I love and to own what I own, um, you know, and that really that really started to open a door for me to return to church. Um, ultimately, it's not really where I feel myself thriving, you know, um, so I'm not a I'm not a Sunday church goer. Yeah. I no longer feel like like the, the religion of Christianity is untouchable to me. Right. Mm -hmm. I feel myself allowed to own um, my own faith and my own spirituality. Yeah, man, what that's such a goal. I know personally, and I'm sure for a lot of people listening, uh, who will listen to this, because I think it's it, I find it very difficult to kind of be in this, um, 
malleable state where you can let yourself love the things that you loved about it um, while also trying to protect yourself from the things that harmed you, yeah. you know, because I, I feel the same way too. There's actually a choir that um, developed over the summer here in Nashville that is, um, it's non-denominational. It's literally just meant for people to come together and sing. And it happens to be gospel music, mm -hmm. but it's people of like all different faiths that get together. And I want to do it so badly, mm -hmm. but I struggle with singing the, the lyrics of things that, that don't bring me comfort, yep. you know, and, and that can, and that can in fact be triggering. Yeah, um, and can and can perpetuate very very harmful messages. So performing them feels complicated. You know, yes, there's there's a lot there. There's a lot there. For sure, there's so much there. And I think also too, I um, I think, a part of being raised in the church, um, there's a lot of manipulation that happens, whether it's intentional or not, like um, whether it's it's done with like good intentions by our parents thinking that they're just trying to do their, their best by us at the time with the information that they have, or whether it is malicious by other parties. And I think once I kind of woke up to that every decision I make around any kind of invitation to the church is always with eyes very wide open, being aware of, uh, am I being manipulated in any way in this moment? Do I want to lift my hands because that's what's expected of me? Or is that, or is that an emotional manipulation and feeling because that's what I, my autonomic response is to do because that's what was trained in me. It's a, yeah, it's a very interesting journey to be on. I think I know you had mentioned when you moved home, the conversations you were having with your parents, I was like, oh, <laughs> like, this is like looking in a mirror. I mean, I, you know, I visited my parents uh, uh, about six weeks ago, and we were having the same uh, things. And do you have any advice for anyone who is maybe n just starting out in this process of kind of waking up to purity culture or maybe doesn't even have the language for it yet or even realize that that's what's happening but just knows that something doesn't feel right like kind of how to navigate those conversations with family because it's very difficult to try and respect where they're coming from with their faith if you don't identify that at all and if you feel like their faith has actually like damaged you. I mean, one of the most important parts of recovery as we move who will go with me to its rightful place at the end of, of our equation, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to the beginning uh, is learning boundaries because mm -hmm. there are people who will not go with us. Yeah. Those people might be some of the most beloved people in our lives. Yeah. And they may want to remain in relationship with us, mm -hmm. but they are not going to support us being who yeah. we are and making the choices that we need to make for ourselves. So, you know, once we identify who those folks are, and this is something I work with folks um, on in coaching a lot. Mm -hmm. um, once we identify who is ultimately, uh, you know, unsafe for our vulnerability, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, and uh, I can talk a little bit more about the process to get there. But but anyway, once we get there, then we need to create boundaries for ourselves and really make some decisions about what we feel comfortable talking about with them, what we don't um, recognize that there are some topics that are simply not worth arguing about because mm -hmm. they're it's they're not going to change their minds um, and it is going to upset and trigger us. Right. Um, you know, recognizing that there's some information that they don't need to know, right? Yeah. That can be ours and ours alone. We can also own our, our lives and our experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, purity culture teaches us that we have to reveal everything in order to be assessed by others, yes. right? Yeah. Not, just, not just our actions, but our thoughts and our feelings. Everything has to be on display. It's just to hurt. Like and, well, or, or, or shamed, justified yes. or shamed, right? Yes. right. Justified or, or confessed, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and then we receive the proper shaming. Yeah. Um, 
you know, but the, the process of revealing too much, you know, is, is very harmful. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it hurts us. Sometimes it hurts others when we reveal things, but we're taught we must at all costs. That's not actually true. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, and learning how to value ourselves and to even maybe hold secrets. And I don't even mean, you know, a, you know, anything wild, but you can have, you can have a thought that is just your own, mm -hmm. you know, and you can make a choice that you are willing to share with these people, you mm -hmm. know, some of whom might not be people who are terribly close to you, but who, you know, will not shame you. You know, maybe you're willing to tell your neighbor about something even, right. Yes. But not with these people who, yeah. with whom it is unsafe to share this information. So yeah. it, it, it's tough. I mean, you know, I walked through, many, many years and with my mom in particular, talking about my faith and my deconstruction and um, purity culture deconstruction and so on and so forth. And I do feel grateful for our conversations. What I will say about my mom that is not true about all moms um, is that she wrestled with it and it was hard for her and it was hard for me how hard it was for her. Uh, but she wanted to listen. Yeah. And to me, that meant that she wasn't on the inside ring of vulnerability and mycocentric circles of vulnerability. Yeah. Um, but she wasn't on the outside ring either yeah. because she was listening. Yeah. And I'm grateful that we ultimately went through these 10, 12 years of conversation with one another in advance of my book coming out because when my book came out and she read it, it actually, you know, she actually talked about how it had less things tr that were troubling to her than she expected. <laughs> you know, <laughs> she had all of this fear associated with yes. what I was going to say. And it kind of created um, a sense of protection in her. You know, when people started to attack me from the evangelical world for the book, she was defensive of me and yeah. really stepped into her mother role yeah. inside of herself and yeah. out of her, uh, you know, religious authority role. Yeah. And it, it created a different dynamic in our relationship for which I'm grateful. That's amazing. I, I feel I'm in a, luckily in a similar position with my parents. I think there are still aspects of like my salvation. They're like very concerned about and lose sleep over at night, uh, but that, that's on them. Um, but but I, I think for the most part, they, they have become, as I've changed my tone with how I broach this topic with them, they have become more and more receptive to having these conversations and also owning the the role that they played in feeding into it which i think is incredible because i think a lot of times in healing you have to make a decision to move forward whether you, or not you get an apology for how someone treated you which can be very difficult to do but uh yeah for anyone else out there listening like if if you don't have that in your lives there are people out here who will listen, who right. will be a safe place. You know, um, I try to be one of those people. You definitely are one of those people. Um, but oh my gosh, I could I could talk with you for literally hours. And I know you're, you're a busy woman. You have things going on. Um, but uh, thank you so so much for being on my little podcast. Uh, it has meant so much to talk with you. And uh, again, uh, before we started recording, I know. It, you had mentioned in your book, like when you were writing it, you were concerned about writing it the right way. And mm -hmm. I, I just think you wrote it so perfectly. And it has been, um, I'm getting like emotional, like thinking about it, but reading this book was really healing for me. And it felt um, really validating to hear other people's stories and know that I was not, um, alone in the pain of processing this and the the pain of the journey that um and the work it takes to like return to yourself and um just thank you i'm really appreciative oh, thank you for saying that and yeah. I, I love what you i love the words you used you know the process of returning to self yeah right. yeah but thank you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, don't, don't. I. It's very. I mean, it's an honor. It's an honor that 
that I, you know, all these years of wrestling with my own pain and now for it to be meaningful to others. Yeah. I mean, it, it is, it is, you know, the great honor of my life. And so thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> thank you for, thank you for listening to the, the call on your life to do this work. You know, I think it, it's not easy work and I don't know that everyone is up to the task of, um, pursuing something like this. Um, and, and, you know, all of the things that it, entails in terms of i i think the freedom that that um not only for yourself but that you help other people discover but also the the criticism that i'm sure comes with it and having to kind of develop this uh thick skin around that um so thank you so much for for like heeding that call and seeing it through and and the work that you do um with people now but yeah thank you so so much for your time today and being with us and um i know a lot of people are gonna get so much out of this and um again the book is called pure by linda k klein um you can pick it up wherever books are sold and oh my god i'm uh, yeah. <laughs> And actually, and actually, do you have do you have it right there? You look like you're I looking do. at it. So yeah. let's so let's let's bookend and talk about the cover for a minute. Yeah. So the cover we ended up going with is you know somebody walking away, right, mm -hmm. and walking into this kind of like hopeful hopeful future, right? But yeah. there's no clear path. It's yes. just this like open Oof. space in front of her, right? That's the you truth. Know? And, <laughs> You know, so I, this is, this is possible, right? There's been an incredible resurgence, you know, of life that I'm, you know, watching spring up around purity culture survivors. Yeah. And it's, it, you know, I know that the theme for your podcast is the first, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so if this is something that resonates with folks who are watching, I would encourage them to take just a first step. It doesn't have to be the whole step, right? Mm -hmm. But what's a first step toward um, really, really owning your own life, you mm -hmm. know, perhaps for the first time, right? Um, you know, maybe it has to do with telling the truth about your life for the first time um, to yourself, to your sister, to someone close to you. Um, or, you know, uh, maybe it has to do with making an action that, that is new for you. Mm -hmm. So I would just encourage people to take that first step because actually there is a bright horizon you know, in the future. Yeah. And, and I, I, I know from my personal experience, that first step doesn't even have to be something huge. You know, I think what's radical for one person can feel like not a big deal for someone else. But I even think for, you know, a, a young girl listening to this, wearing a sleeveless shirt could be like their first radical move and yeah. like, you know, um, uh, getting comfortable with their body, you know, so it's like those those uh, steps can be on a varying degree of scales of whatever feels right for for you, listener. But that's such great advice for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, reaching out, reaching out to others, you know, in the community as well. You know, if you just Google purity culture, you'll come up with plenty of <laughs> plenty of survivors out there, you know, who can sit sit with you um, in in an electronic way, if not in a physical way, but. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, I will share all of your um, like links and where people can connect with you. Um, but yeah, thank you so much again, Linda. I so appreciate your time and your heart and your mind and this book. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so happy I was able to be here. Ooh, okay. So I totally did not plan on getting emotional in this one. But man, uh, religious trauma cuts pretty deep. So to have someone as thoughtful and brilliant as Linda bring light to religious trauma, particularly the trauma caused by purity culture, has made me feel so much less alone in the deep diving I've been doing my entire adult life to process and heal from this. So whether you've already read Linda's book or are now going to read it, I hope that this episode helps anyone else looking for community on this very long journey. Also, uh, this book is just a really great read if you have an experienced purity culture but are just really intrigued by it or you want to better understand and support someone in your life who has experienced it. 
You can buy Pure wherever books are sold, and you can also work with Linda one-on-one or in groups for coaching on deconstruction and purity culture recovery. And you can get in touch with Linda through her website, www.lindakklein.com. And K is K-A-Y, and Klein is K-L-E-I-N.com. So lindakklein.com. You can also follow me on Instagram if you like, at Danny Official, and that's D-A-A-N-I Official. And stay updated over there on the newest episodes. Uh, And you can also do that by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you could take a minute out of your, I'm sure, very busy day to rate, review, and share this episode with someone you think might enjoy it, that would help me out so much as it helps new people find the show. First Time for Everything is produced by Two Sheila's Productions, and our theme song, Closer, is sung by me, written by me and my friends, The Royal Foundry, and produced by The Royal Foundry. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today, and remember, it's never too late for your first time. Get